What I'd like you to input is this general quadratic. This general quadratic that we wrote down. AX squared plus BX plus C. Just pop it in up the top. Write it exactly as you can see it there. And um, bless you. If you write AX squared plus BX plus C, it should prompt you. You've used it before. You're reasonably comfortable with this. It should prompt you, hey, do you want to add some sliders? You know how you're like A, B, and C. What on earth are those? So can you hit that? And then you'll get these three sliders. It'll look more or less identical to what I've got there. I'm just going to give you a second to do that. Now, once you've got your AX squared plus BX plus C, what I'd love you to do is change A, B, and C so that you can see I've got not just any random numbers. I've got particular numbers that I've chosen, and I'll let you work out why it is. Oh, I had to change a thing. Sorry. My A is wrong. Let's do... Uh, oh, I need to make this a bit bigger. Let's... Let me get bigger numbers, please. 20. 20. There we go. There we go. Now we're talking. Okay. So, could I get a show of hands? Who's at least got AX squared plus BX plus C there? Hands up. And you've got sliders, keep your hand up. Yep, okay, that's fine. Even if you're still fiddling with the numbers, no big deal. Can you have a look with me at what we've got on the screen, right? Here is my general quadratic, and hopefully as we were doing this, you're like, I'm familiar enough with quadratics that I knew roughly this is the parabola that I would get. Let me zoom in just a little bit so you can see. There we go. There's negative 2. There's negative 3. These are the zeros. We would call them um, the x-intercepts. I think that was mentioned earlier, right? The x-intercepts of this parabola are the same as the zeros, right? Now, as we pointed out, have a look at my value of a, right? Watch what happens as we change that. Let's just hit play on that. There we go. Oh, where's it going? Oh, it's just gone too steep. It's really steep. Let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. Okay. Now, as we change this value of a, you've got a weird, uh, crazy polynomial happening. Let's go that away. There we go. Right? This crazy quadratic changing places, or all that kind of thing, right? But interestingly, you've got 3, 15, and 18, which are the values we started with, right? So you can see I've got my negative 2 and my negative 3 there. And what's great with this is I can actually take these calculations, a, b, and c, which produce this graph, and I can compare them to what we have just determined, right? Alpha plus beta, these two things, they should always equal, what's this result that I've written here? They, alpha plus beta always equal minus b over a. And I can just write that into Desmos, right? I can say minus, and um, you'll have to go over to your alphabetical keyboard to get b and a, but I'm going to go over there, get my b, and then if I hit division, I can put in minus b over a. And it very handily gives you an answer, negative 5, just like we verified before. Okay? We can also do this not just with the sum of roots, but also the product roots. So what should I input down here? What calculation should I get Desmos to do? C over a. Thank you, Laura. So I'm going to put c and divide and then a. And unsurprisingly, we get 6 like we saw before. Negative 2 times negative 3 equals 6. And the real genius of being able to explore this is we can fiddle with these numbers, right? So for instance, if I took C over there and we made it a bit lower, so I've got 18 at the moment. I'm going to just drop it down like so and choose a scale that's a little more usable for you guys. Okay, so have a look. I've got a value of C as 12 right now. Now we have not factorized this at this instant, right? But have a look. I've chosen this value because I've got some nice whole numbers here. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. There we go. I've got negative 1 and negative 4, right? So when you get the sum of roots, what's the result? Have a look. It's right there. It's just calculated for you. It's negative 5. Hey, wait a second. Negative 5? Isn't that what I got before? Negative 5. Isn't that what I got before? But I have totally different roots. I have totally different roots. And they still add it to the same thing. Why is that? Have a look at the result, right? Alpha plus beta equals what? Minus b over a. So it depends on B. It depends on A. Does it depend on C? The answer is no. What we would say is it is independent of C. So in fact, go take your value of C, right? And this is why I asked you to have a look at it yourself. Go, go fiddle around with it. Change its value. And you can see you'll get completely different roots, but they'll always add up to whatever value it is that they currently state. For me, it's negative 5. For you, it might be something else, because you might have different values for A, B, and C. Okay. And you can get weird numbers, right? Like I, I'm going to take C and put it on something awkward, like say, oops, sorry, 
uncoordinated. I'm going to put on something awkward like, say, 11, right? Oh, I got bad aim there. There we go. All right. Now, when you get this value 11, right, if we went through with a problem like this, you would have some trouble factorizing this, wouldn't you? Right? Why would we have trouble factorizing something which has an 11 on the end? Mastin. Because the x-intercepts are the, yeah. Yeah, look at, look at these x-intercepts. Do you notice they don't land on a whole number? And the reason why is, if what you got given, if what I gave you at the beginning was 3x squared plus 15x plus 11, what would you start thinking? You're like, oh, I need to think of a pair of numbers that adds to this and multiplies to that. But you're like, wait a second, multiplies to 11? 11 is not just any number, it's a prime number. So you're like, great, if it's not 1 and 11, I don't know what it is. So you've got to go to the quadratic formula and you get weird, um, you've got surds in your zeros here, right? So gross. But nonetheless, despite how messy looking this is, what's the sum of roots? Still negative 5, doesn't care, because the sum of roots is independent of C. Okay? Uh, go fiddle with B for a minute. Can you fiddle with B? What happens? You're going to get a, a, a change in your parabola, right? Yeah, things like this. Uh, B is the number that we're... Just slide around B and see what you get. Slide it around. Now, what I'm really interested in is, take B and... Um, Make it a little bit lower. Make it a little bit lower. So I'm going to, and I wonder if you can watch me here, right? What I want you to do is make it low enough. Whoops, sorry, I've got bad aim with my fingers here. Make it low enough that your parabola goes up above the x-axis. This is now me getting out. Why do we care about this? Why is this interesting? Okay. So hopefully you've got something that looks vaguely like this, right? Now, having a look at these numbers here, let's make C something a little bit neater so it's not so gross. Uh, no, I'm always going to get gross numbers here. Yeah, whatever, that's fine. Um, I'm interested by looking at this, right? Because I'm getting a sum of roots. It's, that looks to me like negative 2 and 2 thirds, okay? I'm getting a product of roots, which looks to me like 4 and 1 third, okay? A product of zeros, I should say. Why is this weird? Can anyone point out to me why it might be unusual that the sum of the zeros would be this and the product of the zeros would be this? Does anyone notice anything weird about this? Where are the zeros? I don't see any zeros, do you? Like, the zeros are meant to be where this graph intersects with the x-axis, the x-intercepts, right? You're like, I don't have any zeros. If I gave you this thing here, uh, 3x squared plus 8x plus 13, right? I want you to think back, right? We have a way of determining, before we even start solving this, we have a way of determining, it starts with the letter D, whether something will have zeros or not. What's it called? It's the discriminant, right? And the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. Now, if you're like me, you look at these numbers, you're like, gross, I don't want to work this out. Thankfully, you're sitting in front of a calculator, right? Put a next line in, and let's calculate the discriminant on this guy, right? You're going to need to put in b. What's the next part? b squared, and then minus 4ac. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, you have a different parabola on your screen to mine, probably, at this point, right? But hopefully we can all agree that if you've made your parabola something that's above the x-axis, what do you notice about the value of your discriminant? It's negative. I've got negative 92. It's really negative. Even if you've got something like negative 1 or negative a quarter, right? The point is, this discriminant, it belongs underneath the square root of the quadratic formula. You're like, wait a second, not meant to get negative numbers underneath the square root and your quadratic formula just kind of explodes in your face. That's why there are no zeros. And yet, despite there being no zeros, apparently I can still add them and get something sensible. And apparently I can still multiply them and get something sensible. Let me show you why.